colleagues um, online. There's about a 40 second delay with our, our colleagues overseas, um, but they're, they're also going to be um, asking some questions of Dr. Snyderman, and so we'll, we'll be sure to include them in the discussions. Even though we can't see them, they can see us. So welcome to them. And I'm sorry that they couldn't be here for the, the, the panel discussion earlier. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Snyderman. He uh, served as the Chancellor for Health Affairs and is the Dean of the School of Medicine at Duke University from 1989 to 2004. He is also the James B. Duke Professor of Medicine. During his time at Duke, he oversaw the development of the Duke University Health System, one of the most successful integrated academic health systems in the country, and served as its first president and chief executive officer. Dr. Snyderman also played a leading role in the conception and development of personalized health care and was amongst the first to envision and articulate the need to move the focus of health care from the treatment of disease events to personalized, predictive, preventive, and participatory care that is focused on the patient. He believes personalized medicine, which focuses on new tests and more focused treatments, can save money while also producing um, better results. For his work on personalized health care, he's received, uh, received numerous awards. In 2003, he received the first Bravewell Leadership Award for Outstanding Achievements in the Field of Integrative Medicine. He received the Leadership in Personalized Medicine Award from the Personalized Medicine Coalition in 2007, the Frost and Sullivan's North American Health Care Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008, the Triangle Business Journal's Healthcare Lifetime Achievement Award in 2009, and in 2012, he received the David E. Rogers Award from the Association of Medical Colleges, who recognized him as the father of personalized medicine. Quite an achievement. These are just a few of his accolades that he's received as his role as leader and innovator in healthcare and biomedical science. Therefore, I'm pleased to welcome him to the podium to give you his advice. Thank you. Thank you for that over-the-top uh, introduction. It sounds to me like well it, it may not be totally relevant to uh, uh, people who are working in, in bench uh, uh, research, but I, I will get to that because uh, that's where I started, and I started here. It doesn't seem so long ago uh, that I was uh, doing research here as a, a member of the Public Health Service uh, during the Vietnam War. I don't know if any of you remember the Vietnam War. It was certainly before you were born. Uh, but it was one of the many heydays uh, of the NIH, so it, it's, it's great to be back. And what I thought I'd do today is uh, uh, give you kind of an overview of my long and checkered career and go through points specifically that I thought were major factors in getting me from one place to another place and um, uh, going through that together and say uh, uh, what, what I did and what I learned. You are a very special group. Uh, I don't know whether you perceive that or not, but uh, uh, if there are criteria of who is uh, the best and the best and the most likely to succeed in uh, fields of biomedical research, you have already gone through many, many hurdles to say that you have the potential to succeed and to be leaders in science. But that doesn't mean that you will. It's a long and it's an arduous journey. And uh, I'd like to uh, go over some things that, in reflection, uh, I thought uh, were very important for me, even though I may not have known it at the time, uh, but very much hope that by talking to others, particularly people like yourself, that you could learn uh, from my experience and from the experience of this great panel that I had the opportunity to hear a little bit of. So... Uh, leadership and success uh, in biomedical research. What I'd like to uh, bring to your attention initially is uh, what I and other people call the golden circle. Uh, the golden circle is generally a management tool to try to talk about businesses and try to differentiate those businesses or institutions that may be good from those that are super great. So just an, envision a circle uh, that has three concentric rings. On the outside is the what, in the middle is the how, and in the center is the why. So let's, let's relate that. Well, let, let me just say how it usually is related in business. You think of uh, companies that are truly great, I mean absolutely great, and a company that's been a lot in the news over the last day or two is Apple. 
You know, Apple is almost always in the news. And uh, how do you differentiate what Apple has done from what other companies who are outstanding? Samsung is a great company, but it is not Apple. And in speaking to, to Steve Jobs, uh, he fully understood the, the what, the how, and the why. And, and the why for him was creating technologies that people absolutely loved. They worked well, they answered problems that people had, and they were beautiful. They were beautiful to hold. They were beautiful in their design and their simplicity. What drove Steve Jobs was not only the what and the how, but the what and the how were not that different than his competition. It was the why, and that why allowing him to create things with just a slight but all-important difference that differentiated Apple from everybody else. So how does that relate to you? And to some degree, to the kind of questions and, and uh, conversation I heard when I came in. So the what? You have already decided that you are entering a career in biomedical research. But there are many different doors that you could go through, many, many different areas in which you could perform. Uh, your biomedical research. In addition to that, you could be an academician, uh, you could be uh, an entrepreneur, you could be an educator. There are many different ca careers you could have as a researcher. How you do it? Most of the questions I heard related to, you know, how do you do it? And, and how do you do it well? And, and the how would differentiate one individual from another in terms of the quality, the creativity, uh, maybe the, the, the volume of what they have done, uh, maybe even entering and opening up new areas. So the how is a tremendous differentiator. Both of them are necessary, but to truly succeed, and we'll get back to you know, what success really is, but to sustain the constant difficulties, and you heard it from the panel, 95% uh, of experiments turn out differently than, than you had hoped. And uh, any model that you ever create in research, and I hope the panel and all of you agree with me, any scientific model that is ever, uh, ever created is either wrong or incomplete. The best you could hope for is that it's incomplete and you will keep on trying to build it. Having manuscripts rejected. I came in uh, hearing about manuscripts rejected. Now, I've been at this business uh, quite a while, and I still write, and I still have manuscripts rejected, and it still hurts me to the quick. I mean, it is, it is brutal. It is brutal. Um, what differentiates individuals who sustain and become successful is not only the what and the how, I believe, it's also the why. It is the why, if it truly is genuine, that your interest is in creating something really important, something with impact, whatever it is. You, you, you choose your own why, hopefully. But it is the why, if it is truly meaningful, beyond science being a job, uh, rather than being a job or even a profession, if it becomes a way of life because you have that inherent curiosity and interest and willingness to really create, it allows you to get through those really hard knocks that everybody has. It's a difficult business to be in, believe me. And it's much more difficult now, I think, than when I came in, although when I came in, I couldn't imagine that it, it could be more difficult. So I wanted to uh, start by talking about the golden circle. And as I get into what I will reveal uh, as best I can is my own story, the what, the how, and the why, I'd like you to be thinking, um, maybe even now for a moment, why did you decide to go into research? Not the what or the how. Why? What did you do? You know, what, was there a moment that you felt a calling, something that uh, actually drew you, a compulsion to become a discovery researcher? But think about that. Think about that. And if you can't answer that question, I would say think about it even more. 
uh, why are you doing this? Uh, because that helps sustain you if you truly understand uh, the, the why, the importance of your mission. So let me talk briefly about uh, my, as they say, long and checkered career. And then one of the things that I could tell you that is uh, absolutely a certainty uh, for everybody is what you start out doing is not what you end up doing. What you ever uh, think of uh, a new job to be and you do it, it's going to end up being quite different than you imagined it to be. Uh, and that's one of the joys of life. You know, you, you, you start, you have a pretty good idea, you get into it, and uh, then you, you slug it out and it ends up being quite different than what you expected. But in that, uh, if there is a general central organizing principle, it makes it a lot easier. So, you know, let's go through my story. Uh, I, I was born and I grew up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Anybody here from Brooklyn? This is the first audience I've ever spoken to. Uh, you know, I just, it, very interesting, I, I just gave a commencement address at the uh, Tel Aviv University just last week in, in, uh, in Tel Aviv. And I mentioned something about Brooklyn. Everybody started applying. It, it seemed to me that half of the people there were from Brooklyn. Uh, at any rate, so I was born in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, a place foreign to you. Have any of you been in Brooklyn? And one okay. generation from Brooklyn. Okay, good. All right. Parents. You have roots. In... Okay, so I, I, I uh, came from a uh, blue-collar neighborhood. Uh, my parents uh, came to Brooklyn from uh, the Ukraine. Uh, so I was a first, born, first generation born, uh, went through public schools, uh, and ended up going to a small liberal arts college not that far from here in the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, interesting diversion, and was very fortunate that I did that because had I stayed in Brooklyn, I really would have believed Brooklyn was the world. I didn't think there was anything other than my neighborhood and what I grew up in. But that gave me an opportunity to see that things were different. I was a good but not outstanding student. I didn't apply myself uh, to, uh, uh, to my scholastic work as much as I could have or should have, and I had a very good time in college. But I already knew that I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, for whatever reason, I'll get back into a little bit more, I had made a decision when I was about 12 that I wanted to be a doctor. I ended up going to Downstate uh, Medical School, State University of New York, Downstate Medical Center at Brooklyn. And uh, surprising to me, when I was put in an environment where everybody was interested in what they were doing and studying obsessively, and I kind of heard jumping into the pool, and I jumped into that pool, uh, I ended up surprising myself. I graduated first in my class. And thinking about internships, uh, it really was an important first decision. And I ended up uh, choosing, I uh, really narrowed it down to uh, Duke and Johns Hopkins, which had the reputation of being the most rigorous training programs in internal medicine. And I ended up choosing Duke because they had a program in biomedical research uh, called the Research Training Program that was originated by Jim Weingarten, who actually was director of the NIH probably two decades ago. So I ended up going to Duke, which was a very important decision, uh, as it turned out for me. At that time, uh, it was b the beginning of the height of the Vietnam War. And at that time, uh, physicians, everybody, had compulsory service. So physicians had compulsory service. Um, given the fact that by then I, I wanted to uh, go into research, uh, I was fortunate. I, I was one of the few fortunate people that came to the NIH as a commissioned officer in the uh, public health service in almost, uh, I would say, if the NIH people agree with me, it was a golden era. I wouldn't say it was the only golden era, but it was a golden era at the NIH from, let's say, 65 to 75, rough, roughly speaking, where virtually everybody... Uh, what, that could would wanted to come to the NIH to do research, either because they wanted to do research or they didn't want to be a flight surgeon in Vietnam. So I came to the NIH. 
uh, and then uh, went back to Duke on the faculty. Uh, and then from Duke, uh, I ended up going to Genentech. Uh, have you all heard of Genentech? I imagine you have. Okay, so I went to uh, Genentech. I'll get back more into this story. And then having been at Genentech for a few years, was asked to come back to Duke as Chancellor for Health Affairs. Uh, I did that for almost 16 years, and then since then have, have focused on this uh, uh, concept and, and topic of personalized medicine. So that, that's the, the what that I did. Let's talk about the how. Uh, and uh, obviously we'll only touch uh, what I consider to be some significant points that had big impact on, on my career. Uh, choosing the Duke internship uh, was, was very, uh, very unusual. I could have uh, tried, I don't know whether I would have gotten into the MGH or very, uh, Brigham and Women's, a whole bunch of other places, but I really did want to take the most rigorous training that I could, and I wanted to have the opportunity to do research uh, early during my medical career. Then uh, coming to the NIH, and you know, just let me tell you a bit about what it was like here coming to the NIH in the late 60s. Getting a position at the NIH, um, they, they had a matching program. So uh, laboratories that wanted to have students, and you know, great people at that time, uh, I mean, all, all the big names uh, at that time would have opportunities for uh, individuals to come to their laboratory, but it was very, very selective. For any given slot, they may have many, many hundreds of applicants. So when you apply to the NIH, if you got an interview, that was a big deal. You know, getting in was almost impossible, but getting an interview was something you felt really good about. So I, I applied, and for reasons I don't fully understand, I actually had about 10 or 11 interviews uh, and ended up choosing to go to, uh, for me, being a, a physician of all places, the Dental Institute, that at that time was probably the biggest focus of inflammation research at the NIH because the most important or one of the most important dental diseases, periodontal disease, is an inflammatory disease. So I came to the NIH fresh out of my house staff training program, was given a laboratory, and said, okay, you know, what do you want to do? Uh, the laboratory was interested in, at that time, you know, thinking about what a dark age it was, even though we didn't realize it. Um, it how does inflammation occur? You know, what, what, what is it all about? We knew that uh, given inflammatory insults, uh, in, uh, inflammatory cells would accumulate at a site, but nobody knew how that happened, what were the mechanisms. So I ended up choosing, uh, as it might be relative, relevant uh, in the Dental Institute, how endotoxin, how lipopolysaccharide generated an inflammatory response. And for reasons that I don't fully understand, I became very interested in how did white blood cells migrate from the blood to areas of inflammation? You know, what was that all about? The concept of chemotaxis was a hypothetical concept. You know, nobody had proven that leukocytes could migrate directionally. It was thought by many that the way white cells accumulated at an area is that they would be passing by, and uh, if there were certain <coughs> signals, they would hang up and, and stay there. That was the, the dominant uh, hypothesis. So I came into a laboratory, had some experience uh, in medical school as, re as a researcher, but other than that, it was really just my surrounding, what I read, et cetera. And uh, did an extensive literature search and found what was a, a technique to try to study leukocyte chemotaxis that was in the literature but just didn't work. And the, for the first month or two, uh, I, I did different uh, uh, changes to this technology. Conceptually, it was taking white blood cells and putting it on one side of a microporous chamber putting putative uh, chemotactic agents on the bottom and looking at cells uh, going across the filter. So after about uh, six weeks or so, I actually got it to work. And my golly, I mean, this thing worked beautifully. Uh, I could really do dose-response curves with endotox and this, that, the other thing, and I had a system 
that was working. It was very, very exciting. And then, uh, this is learning point number one. The NIH, uh, I, I don't know, I suspect that it still has courses that people could take, students, fellows, faculty, and I, I decided to take every course that I could. And there was a course in uh, biochemistry and separation techniques uh, that was uh, taught by uh, Dick Metzger. Uh, he, I think, I don't know if anybody re remembers him. He, he was a giant here. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm going on too long. Um, at this course, he started teaching, he was teaching about chromatography, different types of chromatography. And one of the types of chromatography that he talked about uh, was at that time something new, exciting, high-tech called Cephidex chromatography. Um, and uh, so I you know, read about it and we learned about it. And for whatever reason, I decided the day that uh, we had learned about uh, Cephidex chromatography, I ended up ordering everything I needed to do to pour a Cephidex column. And then as soon as I had everything, after going to courses, I went back to my lab in the evening, poured a Cephidex column, took some serum, guinea pig serum, some endotoxin, mixed it together, and then allowed, the, uh, I knew that a chemotactic entity would be generated, and then took this gamish and threw it on the Cephidex column. And the literature at that time implied that the activity of the complement system was due to an aggregation of macromolecular entities. So C5, 6, and 7 were thought to be a very important inflammatory agent. So I did this column expecting that I would see chemotactic activity where I expected C5, 6, and 7 to come out. And I remember, almost like uh, yesterday, uh, being back here at the NIH, sitting at my lab bench, waiting for the column and the fraction collector to come on through, and then as all the different fractions were coming through, I'd take them out, look at it in the microscope, you know, do, set up my experiment. And uh, as the column came out, as you know, in Cephidex, it comes out heavy molecular weights first and lighter second. There was nothing where I expected it to be. And I think I heard the panel you know, talking about bummed out experiments. So, you know, there I was, uh, this thing a total failure. God damn it, you know, it's that 95% <laughs> rule. But for whatever it is, uh, I was sufficiently compulsive that I decided to go beyond all the proteins where nothing was supposed to be, that I would read the rest of, of the column. And then I remember sitting there with my microscope looking at the different samples. And, uh, you know, I might have uh, just reading it, five cells, three cells, five cells, and then all of a sudden, seven cells. That's kind of interesting. Nine cells. Well, I wonder what that could be. 27 cells. 300 cells. I mean, this incredible, massive peak of chemotactic activity coming out with a cytochrome C molecular weight marker. And there was the discovery of C5A. There was more of a story there, but in that one experiment, having been about 10 weeks out of my residency, a whole new concept of inflammation was developed that complement, not from that one experiment, but it led to uh, maybe just two or three more months' work that a chemotactic factor was a cleavage product of the fifth component of complement. And I had been at, the, at this laboratory less than three months. So I consider myself very lucky. I mean, no doubt about it. I was very lucky. But, you know, we'll get back. So, you know, what are the learning points there? But I, I think you could probably see that despite that, you know, I didn't conceive of, gee, it's so important to do this, to do that. But, you know, somehow the idea that whenever you're presented with something new, you really try to embed it and learn it. And what's the best way to learn it other than to try to do it, apply it to what you're doing? And then if you're going to do something, finish the damn thing. I mean, if you, if you think that you have a busted experiment, it may be a busted experiment or it may be the, the greatest gift that you were ever given to discover something new. So at any rate, uh, C5A was discovered uh, I ended up presenting it in a lot of different places, and um, uh, surprisingly for me, 
I ended up getting uh, recognition. And within a year of having been at the NIH, I was being offered faculty positions. Uh, and it was totally surprising to me. Anyway, I stayed at the NIH. I loved it here. This is, and I seriously thought about staying at the NIH as a career. Uh, and I was offered the opportunity to do that. I sometimes wonder what would have happened had I done that. But somehow I had a calling to go back uh, into a uh, academic institution, into a, a medical school, be able to see patients uh, now and then. And uh, being fortunate to having discovered C5A and then a number of other things, the other thing that we did about a year and a half later was discover the first chemotactic lymphokine. So we discovered what we call lymphocyte-derived chemotactic factor. Whoever would have thought that there would be hundreds of cytokines, but that really was amongst the first. So uh, I had uh, about six offers that I thought were extremely good from uh, Duke, University of Pennsylvania, University of Washington, University of Toronto. Uh, it, it was interesting. University of Illinois that offered me so much it was outrageously ridiculous. Uh, and then I think University of Texas. And, and I was really trying to ponder where I should go. So I had a um, very good friend of mine who was my resident at Duke who um, was at UCSF at that time, very, very good geneticist, Dave Martin. And uh, we were over at my place on, uh, off of uh, Georgetown Road, not very, very far from here. And I was laying out to Dave almost uh, like a spreadsheet, the, the, the pros and cons of every one of these places in detail and minutia that must have, you know, must have bored him to death. And we had had at least a bottle of wine, maybe a bottle of uh, and a half. And I, I really respected Dave. And I said, Dave, so what would you do? You know, with all this data, what would you do? And he said, I'd go to the best place. And it was like, wow, I never really thought of that. You know, wh why didn't I think of that? Uh, I mean, he essentially was saying, go to the place that will challenge, challenge you the most that you will be around the best people that will demand the most of yourself. And that's where you ought to go. Um, I think that was one of the most important lessons that I learned. And I'll, I'll, you know, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk. Where you are, who you're with, who your mentors are, who your colleagues are, who you collaborate with is so important. And you should accept nothing other than the best that you are capable of working with. Because what it'll do, if nothing else, it'll set your boundaries. It'll set your lower boundary, things below which you would not accept, and it'll give you an aspirational boundary. And if you are at the best, you'll, you, your boundary condition may be here, and if you're somewhere else, it may be down there, and you'll never know the difference unless you're at the best. So coming back to Duke, I had a chance uh, at that time, it didn't seem like any big deal to me, but my closest friend and the person whose lab was right around the corner from mine was Bob Lefkowitz. Anybody here hear of Bob Lefkowitz? Okay, this is great. I'm going to tell him virtually nobody heard of Bob Lefkowitz. So Bob Lefkowitz won the Nobel Prize two years ago in chemistry. So Bob and I, he's became my closest friend and, uh, you know, really uh, closer than a brother. And he was the, the laboratory next to mine and uh, Jim Weingarten, who was director of the NIH, and Bill Kelly, who was, you know, also very good. So these were really outstanding scientists who demanded a lot of themselves. And having the opportunity of, you know, being really good buddies, running buddies with Bob Lefkowitz, we would talk about research all the time. And uh, I think that uh, that influenced what I did. And my research at Duke was very much related to how chemoattractant receptors worked. So by the time I came to Duke, there had never been an identified chemotactic factor. So our, one of our areas of research was to show that chemotactic factors were actually physical entities. They were proteins that there were G-protein uh, coupled receptor proteins. And then what turned out to be a reasonably big discovery is rather than being coupled to adenylate cyclase, 
we had the first demonstration that it, uh, GPCR uh, could be coupled to phospholipase C. So that was uh, my, my work at, the, uh, at, at Duke. And it was successful enough for me to be a Howard Hughes medical investigator and uh, to get a distinguished chair uh, at Duke and publish kind of routinely at the, in the JBC and occasionally in science, very occasionally in cell. So, you know, things, things were going very, very well at Duke. But uh, one of the things that I had done, which was a, uh, a decision uh, when I was at Duke, is I was asked to become the division chief of a, of a clinical division, rheumatology, which is a specialty that deals with inflammation. I ended up taking the opportunity to be a division chief. Let's use Bob Lefkowitz for a moment. The guy, closest friend, he won the Nobel Prize. I didn't. Bob Lefkowitz was offered the opportunity to be chairman of medicine in virtually every department in the country. He's been offered every administrative position everywhere, anywhere, and always said no. Because Bob understood that an administrative responsibility such as being a division chief of rheumatology would divert his attention from what he really wanted to do, which was only his research. So I think a career-changing decision of, my, uh, of mine, for better or worse, was going into administration uh, as well as research. I wouldn't say it's bad. It, just, it was me, and it was a different career, a different career choice. And then very surprisingly, uh, in about, uh, it was in the late, uh, late 80s, when Genentech uh, already was established, but it by no means was assured of its success. Uh, I was asked to give a talk at Genentech uh, from my friend, the, the same one who pointed me to Duke, Dave Martin, who at that time was the head of discovery research at Genentech. So everything was fine and enjoyed being there. Six months later, they asked me to come back to give another talk. I couldn't understand that at all. Why in the world? I mean, it isn't those six months I had that much more to talk about. But on that second uh, talk at Genentech, which I went to because I love San Francisco, um, they, I'm going to run out of time, so I have to be a little bit faster. Uh, so at that visit, it was a Friday afternoon, and at Genentech they have something called a ho-ho. Uh, every Friday afternoon, everything stops, and copious amounts of beer and everything else is uh, brought out, and everybody in the whole place gets together, including the CEO and the president, uh, and they all have a good time together. <clears throat> so this was after a ho-ho. Uh, Dave said, how'd you like to meet the president? Uh, I said, sure, fine. So I go into the president's uh, office. Uh, everything was nice and friendly, and uh, after 10 minutes, the president said, We'd like to have you come to Genentech. And I was, you know, really kind of confused. Uh, I said, what do you mean? He said, we would like you to come to Genentech as the most senior physician in the company. We need somebody like you at Genentech. And I said, well, what's the job? He said, you create the job. You go home, you tell us what the job is, and we'll give it to you, and that will be your job at Genentech. Uh, and you know, again, I, I didn't take it all that seriously. You know, here I was an academician. The thought of going into industry, uh, even though Genentech was separate in and of itself, it was probably had more specific activity of papers in science and cell. I'm sure all the people here know uh, the outstanding nature of the science of Genentech uh, at that time and to a degree even today. But I, I didn't uh, think that seriously of it. Now, let's get back to Bob Lefkowitz. Uh, he and I would run every day, <clears throat> 10K. Uh, and I remember uh, at one run, I decided I was going to tell Bob about this job. And what he would say is, you've got to be out of your mind. No way in a million years should you ever go to industry. It's totally crazy. Forget about it. And I was prepared to totally forget about it. I remember exactly where we were on the run at East Campus uh, outside of Duke, those of you who know Duke. And I mentioned it to Bob. And rather than saying, you're totally out of mind, you're crazy, he said, you can't turn that down. 
He said, that, I've never heard of anything like that. Now, Bob had been competing very aggressively with Genentech, and he knew the quality of science. So this was a really life-changing decision. I ended up packing my bags and going to Genentech and, given, and being given the job. It was totally outrageous. Um, ultimately, senior vice president for medical research and development. And my responsibilities were the entire department of pharmacology, the entire three entities of clinical research, and regulatory affairs. Now, regulatory affairs means dealing with the FDA, getting regulatory approval. I knew so much about that that when they said, well, one of, your, one, one of the things they added on to my job description was I would be in charge of regulatory affairs. And I remember asking the president of Genentech, what is that? You know, what does that mean? Uh, I didn't know. I didn't have a clue. Uh, and he said, well, well, you know, we'll send you to a course. Two weeks, you'll be fine. Everything is cool. <laughs> you know, the people in charge of it in the company are great. You don't need to worry about it. Okay, so I took the, the job at Genentech, left Duke, I thought, for good. Uh, I mean, packed my bags. I was heading west. Hotel California was something that was very important to me. I wanted to be in uh, San Francisco area in the West Coast. Uh, uh, so that was a, a really exciting time, and I inherited, wow. I mean, talking about getting into something in which you know nothing about, uh, in which you need to learn it very, very quickly, um, and, and having that, that feeling of being totally overwhelmed, you know, talk about drinking from a fire hose, uh, was an experience, it, it was an unbelievable, unbelievable experience. But I'll tell you one, one story about Genentech that relates to regulatory affairs. I said, you know, pharma, uh, pharmacology I knew something about. I mean, it continued to do research, and I even brought my research to the NIH. Clinical research I knew a little bit about. I wasn't an expert, but, you know, I, I did clinical work. Regulatory affairs, I knew absolutely nothing. But Genentech at that time, it was, uh, it was an amazing opportunity to come in at the time of recombinant DNA technology that was being commercialized for human therapeutics. At a time, uh, imagine you are walking into a candy store and you have shelves and shelves and shelves over these incredibly wonderful things, and they say you could choose anything that you want, but you could only choose three or four because anything more than that, you'll get sick or whatever. So Genentech had the opportunity of choosing any recombinant-derived protein to make it into a therapeutic. And that choice, uh, the success of the company depended on choosing the right molecules. So at any rate, getting back to the story, one of the, the initial blockbusters of re recombinant DNA technology and proteins was a protein called TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. The brand name was called Activase. And what TPA did was dissolve clots. And the use of TPA was to be given intravenously when people had an acute myocardial infarction and open up the vessel so you could have reperfusion much more quickly, because before then, there was no way of doing it. So at any rate, when I took the job at Genentech, it was thought that TPA pretty much was approved by the FDA. I mean, they believed it, and the company depended on it. When I came to the company, when I gave up my, uh, my distinguished chair, I gave up my used position, I essentially cut my cord with Duke, and I was at Genentech, they were surprised by having yet one more review of TPA, this time by drugs rather than biologics. And in that review, which Genentech took for granted, this is just, you know, it, 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 it is just theater. You know, the drug is approved. In this advisory committee, the advisory committee, and I remember being there, uh, the advisory committee voted... 11 to turn it down, and two abstentions, and zero to approve it. It was, I mean, this was one of the most dismal failures of TPA. And this was, I mean, the Wall Street, uh, Genentech was Wall Street's baby. 
And I mean, this was a disaster. This was an unmitigated disaster. So here I had been at Genentech maybe a month and a half or two months and found out that this regulatory issue was, was the life or death of this company. So here, two things happened. I was working, uh, since regulatory uh, uh, reported to me, I was getting involved with TPA. And I thought I was doing a lot of work in getting involved with TPA. But one day, uh, an another vice president who was mentoring me came in to see me for a, a weekly meeting, and he said, Ralph, you may think that you were leading the efforts on TPA, but you're not. You're participating, but you're not leading. If you want this company to survive, you need to take total ownership of it, make it yours, and lead it. And when he said that to me, it was really almost like a, a knife in the chest. I mean, it was somebody, uh, they were asking if they ever had a disappointment. Uh, wow, I mean, I just started a job, and here one of my co-VPs saying, you're not doing your job. You need to take total ownership of it. And I'm not sure I'd ever taken total ownership of something that I didn't feel so confident about. So, again, I'm mindful of the time. What I ended up doing is going to the president of Genentech. I told this guy, Mike Ross, supposed to be an hour meeting. Ten minutes into it, he told me this. I said, Mike, please leave. I need some time. One of you said you need some time to think. I kind of threw him out politely, needed some time to think. Thought for about five minutes, walked down, barged into the office of the president, and I said, Kirk, if it's okay with you, I want to take ownership of TPA. It's going to be my baby. Uh, I'm going to take over. He said, fine, go ahead and do it. And I said, okay, the guy who was leading it up until now, who was pretty much a legend at Genentech, who really screwed up this last review thing, I said, Kirk, I may need to fire him uh, if he doesn't accept me in this role. He said, and remember, go ahead and do it, but remember your psychology 101, I'm talking about speaking to people. So I ended up going in there, managed to convince Elliot Grossbard, who was a bit of a legend as a clinical researcher, that I was going to be in charge uh, and took over uh, TPA. Now I'll just tell you one more story about TPA. We, uh, it was, I think, March, uh, May 21st that we had this negative uh, review by the Cardo Renal Advisory Committee. The CEO of Genentech comes to me and he said, Ralph, uh, we were expecting TPA to uh, bring in 400, uh, what was it? I think it was $400 million uh, within two years, uh, $400 million a year. And he said, um, I know you don't know much about industry, but you divide that by 365, and that's how much we're losing per day that TPA is not on the market. So I did the math very quickly in my head, and I could understand what each day meant. Uh, and I ended up calling the person at the FDA who was going to be responsible for what we needed to get it approved. And I spoke to him. Uh, it was probably about a quarter to 12 or so, and he laid out all the things that we would need to do to get TPA approved. I hung up the phone realizing we couldn't do it. What he wanted to have uh, was a mortality, show that TPA improved mortality, a whole bunch of stuff, which would have taken three or four years worth of experiments and money, which we didn't have. And at that moment, when I hung up the phone, I realized I was the only person in the world who knew that Genentech was going under, because there was no way we could ever fulfill that hurdle. There's just no way. And I was depressed, for better or worse, it was almost like losing a loved one. I mean, it was, holy smokes, this whole beautiful entity with all these people working here and the great science and papers and cell and everything else, it's going to go under. And I was so depressed. I mean, I really was almost besides myself. So what did I do? I went out for a run. Uh, I used to be a runner. So um, just about noon, I went out for a run, and I remember, again, see, these things are so vivid in my mind. First quarter of a mile or so, I was despondent. I mean, I was really despondent. 
But then if it's the runner's high or being able to focus or whatever, by the time I came back after 10K, 6.2 miles, running around Oyster Bay, it's not a bad place to run, I was so supercharged and psyched because I had a plan. Uh, and the plan is kind of ridiculous as I think about it. The plan was not to do all those things which we couldn't do. The plan was to convince the FDA that this was friggin' ridiculous and that there's got to be a different way to do it. Uh, I mean, it just made no sense. And ended up speaking to the second in command, not the top guy, but the second in command who truly loved the science. And we really worked out a, a way that he would become much more involved and that we would come up with a clinical surrogate that was much more important than what we had shown, which was reperfusion of the heart muscle. So to make a very long uh, story short, rather than showing that TPA improved mortality, we showed that TPA improved left ventricular heart motion, which was a very good surrogate of the clinical benefit, and the FDA agreed, and it was approved in five months and 13 days later, still a record of going from an advisory committee turned down to an approval. So, you know, there is a lesson there. You could figure out what it is. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it may be that issue of persistence. And uh, I, I also think it, to some degree it's the why. Okay, now, since time is almost running out, uh, I, I love my experience at Genentech. I was promoted to be senior vice president. And uh, having been there in un under three years and really for the first time, uh, feeling that I was truly living in San Francisco as a Californian as opposed to an Easterner. Um, and just, it was really ironic, very embedded uh, in, uh, in the Bay Area, coming back from a meeting uh, at Asilomar. No, this was a meeting at Lake Tahoe and making a turn and looking at the Bay Bridge and seeing San Francisco. And the guy who was with me again is Dave Martin. And I said, Dave, for the first time, I really feel as though I belong here. Go back to my office at Genentech, and I have two pink slips for phone messages, both from Duke, one uh, from a, I'm not gonna believe it again, Bob Lefkowitz, uh, who was a member of the search committee for the Chancellor for Health Affairs at Duke. And I remember picking up the phone, Bob said, okay, at this moment, I want you to sit down, get a piece of pencil and a paper, write down the date and the time, because this call is gonna change your life. Just tell you a little, uh, another little piece of me, which is really, I never know how to put this in context. I always had my clock set five minutes fast because I wanted to be on time. So here's Bob Lefkowitz saying, write down the date, that was easy, write down the time. I still, I'm still perplexed. Do I write down the time of the clock, which is five minutes fast, or the real time? And I don't remember which I did, but I, I still don't remember what I did, I, and I don't know what I would do if I was given that choice again. But at any rate, Bob told me that the search committee had identified me not as in the short list or whatever, that I needed to come back to Duke. Duke needed me, and for reasons that were more emotional than anything else, I went back to, excuse me, to Duke as Chancellor for Health Affairs and uh, took on something totally new. Uh, if you think about starting as a bench scientist, and trying to answer questions, and trying to ultimately answer, if your research goes well, the kind of questions that you answer have increasing complexity and maybe increasing importance in creating a model which is more representative of what life really is, moving from my C5A and inflammation to medical research and development at Genentech, to Duke was a whole new thing. It was really a whole new thing. And um, since I still have about seven minutes left, one of the things that I had to learn being chancellor uh, for health affairs at Duke and dean, it, it's like being the emperor of a very, very small kingdom. I mean, a little tiny kingdom. But in that tiny kingdom, people actually take you seriously and, and listen to you. And, and what I realized is that as a scientist, the, the most important ways that you make progress is you think, you hypothesize, you do an experiment, multiple experiments, 
and you either disprove or support your hypothesis. But it really is you, your experiments, and trying to seek a solution. I proceeded to do it that way as Chancellor for Health Affairs. Uh, I knew that there were certain changes that we needed to do at Duke and sat and figured them out and then figured out, you know, once I figured it out, boy, that should really work. Let's go out and do it. What I realized is that outside the laboratory, figuring out, even if it's a right answer, is maybe 10% of the solution. The real solution re involves getting everybody else to see it that way. That's number one. And number two, having the humility to understand that you are likely at least partially wrong so that you need to learn from other people. So uh, l let me end uh, by saying, you know, I've had this long and very tortuous uh, career um, at Duke uh, starting off as a, a dean and a chancellor for health affairs, I had the very good fortune, and I'll talk about it more later at 2 o'clock, about this concept of personalized health care, of seeing the, the very first wave of a whole series of new technologies that would allow medicine and health care to be pract practiced totally differently. It's, it's like pivoting 180 degrees, and I'll, I'll try to explain that. But even though I was in a, an administrative position, the joy that I had having come up as a scientist is that I understood it was pretty much the same business. In many ways, it was the same business. It was problem solving. The way you went about it, the tools that you used were different, but the concepts were very, very similar. The degree of complexity was far greater, uh, but the precision and, and, and sometimes the joys of it were much more distant. In, in many ways, it's much more exciting. What could be more exciting than to read a column and to say, wow, there's something totally new and exciting? It's much more distant as you get into big-time administration. But nonetheless, if you understand what you're doing and you understand that you're really an experimenter in a different way, it makes it very important and very exciting. So let me end up... Specifically, okay, so, you know, why? You know, why did I do this? The real answer is I don't know, and the real answer is you don't know. Uh, it is really a deep philosophical question that perhaps a, a Buddhist monk could address far better than me, uh, but it's very difficult to understand why. But at least in my consciousness, I really did uh, uh, learn from my parents that it was important to leave something in a much better condition than the way you found it, that the greatest joy was learning, and learning is a lifetime event, and that one should always associate with people that one could learn from. So that was embedded in me. Uh, being a physician uh, struck me as a very important calling. Once I made that decision when I was 12, it then became obvious that uh, by the time I was in high school, that if I were going to be a physician, why not be a medical researcher? Because rather than limiting what I could do with one individual, I might be able to do things that could benefit many, many people. So there was the concept of leverage. And then coming to Duke, uh, it may or may not be the same principle, but it was being able to leverage a whole institution in a very, very big way. So that's the closest that I could come to. But I could tell you that uh, in the earlier conversations, so what do you do when you have defeats? They, they abound. They abound. And, and it's the why that creates one of the most important characteristics of being successful in a career and being able to lead, and that is persistence, showing up. At every stage in my career, I always felt that there were many people around me who were far better, smarter, more capable in every way than I am or was. But along the way, they tend to disappear. Uh, you know, where did they go? Uh, but the people who show up, cons you know, consistently do it, uh, tend to be the ones who are ultimately successful. You clearly, uh, you know, the obvious things, preparation and focus, but a point that I already made, and I really cry out to you, choose the best environment that you're capable of, of having. Challenge yourself. Don't go for the easy way out. I think 
If I look back at my research career, I would grade myself as a solid B plus, A minus researcher in the big leagues. Uh, I was, that's about the best I would grade myself. But I never would have made it to that direction if I had not been around really, really good people. And had I had <clears throat> even better mentors, maybe I would have been a little bit better. I don't know. <clears throat> but choosing the best is a very good thing to do. <clears throat> and then, uh, again, I was so glad I heard the end of the mentorship, failed experiments are a blessing. If you almost play a game, and I've you know, been around researchers who do this, you, you, you look at an experiment and say, God damn, it didn't work. And then you show it to somebody else, they say, are you kidding me? Do you see you know, what this could be? And you know the controls, the, the experiment didn't work. But they find the most exciting things in virtually any experiment. Now, you can't delude yourself, but you know, look for the outliers, be an orthogonal uh, thinker, <clears throat> and um, learn from your failed experiments. And to a degree, uh, pragmatically, I, I think the great researchers that I've seen have had enough confidence <clears throat> in their ideas that they're willing to take risks. Now, they may be calculated risks, but betting on developing the technology you need to solve a problem, as opposed to having a technology and finding problems to solve, is a real differentiator between the great and sometimes the very good. So let me end uh, by saying that uh, I talked too long. I, I apologize for that. But it's an honor to be with you. If, if any of this uh, sticks with you uh, as you go along or come back to it, it would be a great achievement. And if you are thinking about the why and really reach into yourself either now or when you're alone and quiet, Really think about the why. Why are you doing this? There are a whole bunch of different things that you could be doing. And do you have that passion, that why, that will sustain you uh, through the hard times? Okay, thank you very much. So if we have some time for some oh, yeah. questions. We have the folks in the UK that are sending through some questions. So maybe we can start with a question here, and we'll, we'll take a look at our questions on the computer. Anybody have a question for Dr. Snyder? You made it sound all very simple and easy, <clears throat> and that these successes sort of fell into your lap, but it's really the preparation and the successes in the lab that really led to those opportunities. Would you, would you agree with that? I, I would agree, and I would say that, um, let, let me talk about all of you. Uh, you, you have a level of intelligence, uh, capability, that has already been tested, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You may doubt it, but uh, you have the capability of being really good. Some of you may be outstanding. Some of you may decide that this isn't for you. Uh, but the issue, I, I think persistence uh, is, is very, very important. You know, I've, uh, I've gotten more and more involved in business. I still consider myself at heart a physician scientist. If somebody said, what, what would you like to consider yourself? I'd say a physician scientist. But I've gotten uh, you know, very, very heavily involved in business as well. In business, they always talk about, well, you have a plan A, but what's your plan B? You know, if, if A doesn't work, what's your fallback position? And you know, I totally support. That makes a heck of a lot of sense. But you will find times in your life, mark my word, where there is no plan B. You need to make plan A work. Um, and you find yourself in that position. And you know, be tough, uh, you know, be right, be good, be intelligent, but be persistent. And I think that if there is anything that uh, might account for an individual who, you know, let's say, is a, a high normal kind of a individual is the fact that I have a dogged persistence.
Yeah. Um, so, so the question is, is there a characteristic that uh, identifies really good, high-achieving individuals, individuals that, I'll just expand a little bit, that you might aspire to be around? Uh, I think that's a very, very good, uh, good question. And I think, um, for me, the answer is the incredible um, sincerity of wanting to be doing what they're doing. It, it really is that why. Uh, it is that burning uh, desire to be very good at what they're doing. It's no nonsense. It's not theater. It is a, a really deep, genuine uh, passion for what they're doing. Uh, if I think of, I, I cannot think of any, any exception of the people that I would like to emulate or individuals that are you know, reasonably successful that I wouldn't want to emulate that you don't differentiate by the depth of the sincerity, that burning flame of, of what, they, what they want to do. Um, uh, getting back again to Bob Lefkowitz, you know, sorry, but you know, he, uh, he and I are, are very, very close and uh, talk about things like this all the time. And what Bob would talk to me about uh, was how when, when he had an, an experimental area uh, that he wanted to get into, he said he would ponder it, but he would actually live it. He would hover over it. You know, he would have the question, you know, this is the question. And he would actually surround it with his essence. I mean, he, he could actually, it became part of him. So while he might be playing with his kids or w whatever he was doing, and, uh, it, it, it was part of him. It was part of him. Uh, so I, I think the people who are really good are uh, what they're doing in their research or what they're doing in whatever they're doing is part of, of their uh, their way of life. And, and I started off by saying there are jobs, there are professions, and there's a way of life. And you could choose what you do. You know, and, and I wouldn't in any way say that there is a right or a wrong choice. But if science is, in a sense, a way of life, and here let me say, the idea of success, if, another question you might ask yourself, what is success? Is it going to be faculty rank? Is it going to be publications? Is it going to be awards? Uh, maybe other kinds of recognition. Uh, those things are important achievements. But truly success is something that comes from within. And to have the kind of life and, and career that I'm talking about, I would hope does not preclude you from truly understanding, appreciating your family and understanding the importance of you. And ultimately, it's your own judgment that judges your success. Uh, it's your own perception of what that is. So it sounds a little contradictory, but um, when I talk about science or the kind of things that we're doing as a way of life, I'm really thinking of it holistically. And if you think of it holistically, uh, then it, um, it is a differentiator. And I think the differentiator is that the why, you know, what really compels people to do it. Question from Jason Murray in Cambridge. So he's back there in the camera. Um, do you Jason? think you have made a bigger impact on the world as a scientist or through your work in industry, academia, as an administrator? That's a tough question. I, um, I mean, in, in a way, it's, uh, I wish I could give you a different answer in a way. I would say that um, I've already judged myself as a let me give, give myself the benefit of the doubt, uh, an A-minus quality scientist. I could say that discovering C5A and uh, chemokines and, and uh, reg regulation of chemotactic factor receptor, that was pretty good stuff. But one of the reasons I ended up going to Genentech is that uh, when we had published, which was a very big deal at the time, activation of phospholipase C, through a G-protein coupled receptor and showing it uh, by, you know, direct act activation of the enzyme. That was a big deal. It was published by another laboratory three months later. And I realized that, okay, I was in a reasonably good position, but if I disappear from the face of the earth, you know, there might be a gap of three months 
uh, before something else is discovered. And, uh, you know, it kind of, I, I, I may not have been so consciously, but I was thinking, you know, why, why am I wasting my time doing this? So I, I, I appreciate and I love the career I had as a scientist. Uh, but I think that the overall impact, I'm hopeful, of personalized health care will probably have an impact on more people than my science. I can't tell you if somebody you know, said, pick up one of these two cars, what would you want it to be? Uh, I'm not sure which one I would choose. It's, it, I'll, I'll think about that over the next couple of days. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Outside of personalized medicine, what do you think Wow. I think that there, there are such, such vast opportunities. I, in, in a way, I'm not sure that that's an answerable question uh, because there are, one of the things that I, that, that I learned is that if whatever area that you pursue, uh, I, in some ways I describe the door that you go into. Uh, I went into research through the door of looking at leukocyte chemotaxis. Other people might go in through looking through some other door. But if it's biomedical research, you ultimately, as you probe deeper and deeper and deeper, get to some basic principles that are applicable in very, very broad areas. So the door that you go into... Um, to some degree, is going to impact how quickly and how well you get into that deeper, more fundamental, important understanding. But if you're really good, it'll lead you there. Now, if you say, what is the most important research that has direct application, direct application? Uh, I think uh, uh, a lot of people would argue uh, and say that if you go down the idea of stratifying research based on even envision application right now to the exclusion of purely discovery research that has no known application, if you look back historically, probably the greatest discoveries had no application at the time. So uh, I would be very reluctant to, uh, to choose. I, I think... You know, my answer without trying to cop out is that there are so many opportunities now. You know, there are so many areas because the technology, uh, when I was starting, there was a lot of discussion of the great scientists, is it the idea or is it the technology? Almost separating the technologist from the real hypothesis-driven discoverers. I think that's a very false way. You know, I think it's, it's, it's almost totally iterative between technology and discovery. And I think the blessing that you have now is the richness of the technology and the precision of the technology. I wish I could give you a better answer. I was hoping you just... <laughs> That's a good one. You know, that would be on my list. I was actually at a meeting in Denver this weekend, and we had a similar discussion with a couple other scientists, and they, they posed the question, like, where did all the great scientists go? You know, there was this era in the 90s where there was like these names you could identify. They were doing these amazing things. <coughs> and sort of the conclusion we came to is that there really are, the tools are available to everyone now. It really comes down to having the money to execute your question. I mean, all the tools are there to ask amazing, great questions and make great advances. So a lot of people, that's the answer, is a lot of people are making great contributions. So you all have that opportunity. That's what we thought. I think the opportunities are, are very profound. The question is, how do you choose, and to what degree will you have the ability to choose? Uh, you know, what, what is the freedom that you will have to, to go where you want to go? Um, but you know, that's one of the mysteries of life. And the fact that you're here means that you're off to a really good start. In, 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 your, in both your academic career and, and in industry, did you often see people have uh, certain blind spots or like some areas that were you know, never touched upon 
uh, for an extensive period of time because of some group thing like for instance, you know, group thing like behavior. Uh, and uh, you know, how do you try to find these things out by yourself? The answer is uh, absolutely yes. And uh, that's actually a, a very important, uh, uh, important principle is that it is so easy, uh, particularly as you get to larger groups, but I think in laboratories also, is to get into groupthink and um, to not have the courage to voice uh, a question uh, or an objection to groupthink. It's very, very tough. And uh, so have I seen it? The answer is yes. It's very, very common. <clears throat> what, what do you do about it? For me, what I will do, um, actually, I actually go through it, and, and you might find it. If I am in a, a situation in which I think what the entire group is saying or thinking or doing is different than what I'm thinking, uh, and the easiest thing would be to say nothing, I ask myself, you know, to myself, uh, when I go home tonight, will I feel comfortable of having said nothing? Uh, and almost invariably, I tell myself, no, I would not feel comfortable. So I will say something. You know, having grown up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, may make it a little easier for me uh, than others in the South who uh, at least seemingly are more polite. But ultimately, everybody is, is the same. They just express it differently. Uh, but I think that's uh, as you see it. And, and there, is, there is a story uh, I wish I could find it for you. If you give me your email, it's called uh, The Road to Abilene. It's a very, uh, very famous business lesson in which it's a story of some people in Texas and they're trying to figure out where do they want to go for breakfast and somebody says, well, you know, why don't we go, there? Why don't we go to Abilene, which is a godforsaken place, nobody ever wanted to go there. And um, for whatever reason, the whole group, nobody wants to contradict it, and they end up going to Abilene for breakfast, which is the most you know, ridiculous thing in the world. But it really gets to your point uh, when people do not speak up. And then there are much more important issues that go well beyond science. But I think asking, your, asking yourself the question, whenever something comes up in a group and you don't feel comfortable with what the group is saying, Ask yourself, don't necessarily blurt out, because sometimes you'll say, gee, I just don't know enough about it to say anything. Uh, that may happen. But ask yourself, will I feel comfortable with myself if I say nothing? Yes. So kind of following on from that, have you ever said something and then wished you had? Yeah, uh, some, uh, I do. Um, I wouldn't say really big, important things, you know, big principle things, but um, I will some, I mean, it, it, it happens to me from time to time. I, I will, something will happen, I'll kind of blurt out an answer, and then, you know, given uh, probably my age and various other things, people often will say nothing, which is kind of amusing when I realize, oh my God, I just said something so stupid, uh, and I was wrong. Um, but the answer is yes. And, you know, this is another good learning point. Some, some of the individuals that have been uh, the most acknowledged people in various areas are those that will say there's no such thing as a stupid question and almost by intent. And as chancellor, I would do it sometimes, although I never felt comfortable to allow people to express themselves, I you know, sometimes would say something reasonably stupid. Uh, just so, and then I might say, look, if I could say that, you could express anything you ever want to express. But I think that um, to some degree, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of self-confidence, uh, and it's not easy to be identified as being wrong. Uh, but but I would say it's a it's a worthwhile thing to muster one's courage and not be afraid to say things. And if it's wrong, it's no big deal. It's not a real big deal. Uh, the chairman of medicine at Duke, Gene Stead, an icon, used to say the most ridiculous things in the world. Uh, so he would say maybe five ridiculous things and three brilliant things. And people just remembered the brilliant things. 
and understood that, well, it was just his manner. He would say some stupid things as well. So uh, the answer is yes. And it's, it's, not, it's not bad. Yes? Well, we're going to take one more question because we need to wrap it up soon. Thank you for coming and speaking with us today. Um, you touched a bit about family and living a holistic life. And I think at this point in our lives, we're wondering both what we should be doing with our lives, but also how we should be living our lives. Touch a bit about your professional life and your non-professional life and how they balanced and complemented each other. Yeah, I would start by saying I'm not a good example. <clears throat> and um, a lot of my colleagues coming up in the late 60s, early 70s uh, were really very driven. And uh, I think virtually all of us would say if we had the opportunity to do it again, we would have done it somewhat differently. Um, for myself, I think what I would tell myself if I were you know, talking to me sitting out in the audience is pay more attention to ultimately what is going to be most important to you. Because uh, uh, you, know, you heard that I won a number of awards. Um, I have given them no thought whatsoever. You know, they, it's nice, but it's of, of no significance to me. Uh, when I play with my granddaughter, it is one of the most wonderful things in the world. And seeing my son develop into, or my two sons develop into individuals that surprise me um, with who they are and what they are, that's really important. So I think, putting myself back where you are, I wouldn't necessarily do things differently, but I would understand that one needs to value family and self. And if there's one way to increase the effectiveness in both, I would say it is mindfulness, being much more mindful. Uh, what I learned much later in my career, got exposed to people who were in mindfulness meditation uh, and actually practiced mindfulness meditation. And some of the things in my career, a whole different thing, actually got to spend time with the Dalai Lama. Um, and what I find is the, the concept of mindfulness is a very powerful way to try to balance uh, the, the career, the profession, with understanding when you're with your family and your kids. That's the most important thing in the world, not thinking about your experiment. Okay, and thank I think you. We should uh, thank Dr. Snyderman for taking the time to come. <clears throat> um, in addition to a big thank you from the NIH Oxford Cambridge Scholars Program, we have Beatrice Renault from the Last Foundation. Thank you so thank much you so for much. participating in our first lecture. I wanted to thank you for inspiring us and giving us all this uh, knowledge about your career and, and all the changes and also to inspire the students in this program. This is our first lecture in the last lesson in leadership. Uh, we'll have the next one, uh, we have the colloquium in Cambridge on the 21st of June, but we'll also have a, our next lecture on the 4th of August. And uh, I hope you uh, were as inspired as I am. I'm also a scientist, but uh, I've chosen another path. I went into publishing, and now I'm at the Lasker Foundation. So this is also inspiring because there's not just academia. There's many other paths that you might be inspired by. And so thanks again. Well, thank you. This and, is very touching. And uh, so we hope that uh, we all see you again on the 4th uh, of, June, of August. And uh, we want to welcome your feedback. You'll have a, a little uh, survey at the end of today. And we would like to hear your comments about today, but also about future topics that you want to hear about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And please stick around. There's a lunch. And then at 2 o'clock, Dr. Snyderman is going to give a talk really about personalized medicine, which I think will be really exciting. You'll, you'll hear about how his, well, your next big phase of your career, right? Yeah. So thank you. <laughs>